Okay, so uh, I ask for grace this morning as we dive into the Word. If you've got your Bible, uh, thank you so much. Uh, you can turn to 2 Corinthians 5, verse 14 to 15. And in the early morning service, do you think I could pronounce Corinthians? Uh, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 14 to 15. As you're turning there, I want to ask you a question. What actually drives you? Like what gets you up in the morning? What, what motivates you? There's a famous statement, uh, I think it was Steve Jobs, who said, uh, uh, do what you love and you'll never have to work a day in your life. And that is spoken such like a workaholic, because I am one of the few people on the planet that love what I do. And I mean deeply love being a pastor and studying the Word and, you know, literally just being surrounded by theological books. I love it. But I'll have a confession for you this morning. There are weeks where I wake up on a Monday and I know I have to go and teach a theological class and I'm like, another week. <laughs> so we know that's a lie. So what motivates us? What actually gets us up? What gets us going? Now, I mean, you're in church. So we all know that what really motivates you this morning is Jesus, right? Right? Yeah. Preach it. Come on, someone. Amen. Eh? <laughs> I mean, we are in church, except Monday comes, and we have to wake up in the dark because, you know, for this week, we're lined up with load shedding right when we have to wake up. So not only do we have to wake up in the dark, we don't even get our coffee, and suddenly, what drives us is not so much <laughs> Jesus. I mean, it's there. He's there. And we're like, Jesus, get me through this. But what drives us? I mean, let's be real. A, a multiple of things come together to make you what you are and drive you. I mean, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? These multiple things. I mean, any of you who've been recently married or planning to get married, what wakes you up in the morning is the wedding, right? You're on it all the time. I wasn't like that. My wife was, and I must admit... Uh, she came to me the one day and said, what color do you want the napkins can be? And I was like, I can't express how little I care. Like, <laughs> there is no part of me that can get excited about the color of the napkins. Go wild. However, she said, listen, we need to figure out the food. I'm like, I'm there, like a bear. Let's go chase. We tasted all the foods. I'm like, the fillet's amazing. That's my bag. We all have different things that motivate us, right? Now, the thing is, these complicated and varying things interact with each other. And this is where having one overriding, driving reality of your existence will prevent you from falling apart when your needs fall apart, when the world gets tough. William often st says from the frontier, and I completely agree, agree with him, I do not know how Christians are coping with the 21st century. I mean, man, the world is a nightmare out there. And I know church should be a sanctuary from that, but let's just take in cognizance right now. It's tough. And I don't know how people are coping. And so I really encourage, or at least hope, that today at the end of the sermon, if I do my job right, that we refocus our lives on what really matters. Not so that we just become like single-minded, but that everything in our lives starts to make sense in light of this one reality. So what is that? Well, for that, we're going to have to turn to the Scriptures. But before we get there, let's just ask something. You know, we generally want to build our lives. I mean, right now, you wake up every morning and it's about going, going, building, getting enough, doing enough. And because you're Christian, I'm going to assume that, it's also about like teaching others, reaching others, preaching the gospel. There's the stress of that. And so we bring into our minds as we go as Christians and say, you know what, I'm going to tackle this world. I'm going to preach, gospel. I'm going to preach the gospel. I'm going to extend the kingdom of God. And that's going to be my motivating factor. But we don't. We get embarrassed. We get worried that we don't know what we're going to say. We get worried that we won't have enough information when people challenge us. 
And I want to show us in that church as we deal with that tonight, uh, this morning, that in fact in those things, we've replaced the real thing of our lives with an activity. Let me say something controversial. And it's going to be in church. The preaching of the gospel is the result of what should actually drive us. The kingdom of God is the result of what should drive us. Peace, happiness, goodness is the result of what should drive us. So what should drive us? Well, simply put, Christ. We will explain what we mean by that. For that, let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14 to 15. This is the word of the Lord. For the love of Christ controls us. Because we've concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. May the Lord bless the reading of his word this morning. Now, before I get into the single thing of what motivates Paul, let's look at what Paul is, who he is, what, what, what he kind of puts aside for the single reality. Paul boasts about who he is. He says, I am a Jew of Jews, a Benjamite of Benjamite, trained in the greatest teacher of the day, Gilgamel. In fact, some have argued that Gilgamel was probably one of the greatest thinkers of his time. Paul was his student. This was like graduate of Harvard level smart. And not only that, but from like Rothschild family, you know, super connected, super um, up there in terms of what to boast about. But that doesn't motivate Paul. He sets that aside. His, his long lineage does not motivate him. His influence, his education, nothing motivates him but what? The love of Christ. This is what constrains him. And it's not just the love of Christ for Paul, but the love of Christ for Paul and everyone that constrains him. Paul, in a sense, is captivated day and night by this idea that Jesus loves the world. And this gets him up. It drives him and motivates him. It controls everything he does. In fact, the word that controls him in the Greek literally means shuts me up so that I can do no other. Now, I don't know if you've ever been in a situation where something is so important, so immediate, that you cannot talk, you just act. I had one of those experiences at this church. Um, it was a chaotic morning. I was on worship, doing multiple things. I was rushing back and forth. And this was a time where it was more consistent to have tea and coffee after the service because, you know, load shedding was not a thing then. And I was running with my cup of tea, and I was talking to someone, and I just made it. I was super stoked to have my cup of tea. And as I turned around... One of the children in the church, the Mitchell's kid, um, Emily, ran perfectly into my elbow. She was running past, but such a good way that it popped the entire tea out. I literally watched it like leave my cup as an entire cup of tea and land on her head. Like fully, she got baptized in tea. Now, I've got to give a ca caveat here. A couple of months before, I'd seen one of my friends, we were at there for, for lunch, and the kid pulled the cup of coffee on a tiny kid, he was like uh, eight months, nine months, pulled the coffee onto himself, and his dad literally in like, it was superhuman movement, went past, grabbed the kid and just jumped into the pool. And uh, sat there when the kid with the pool got out, no marks, no burns, nothing, the kid was fine. So that was running in my head. So I'm watching this thing, and it's like slow motion. It hits the kid's head, and I was like, instantly I knew what to do. There was no time to talk. I wasn't like, help, everyone stop, move out the way. I literally somehow got the cup out of my hand. I still don't know how that happened. I thought I dropped it, but in fact, it was placed nicely on the side. I grabbed this kid, and I shoved her under the tap in the kitchen as fast as... I literally didn't know how I got there, but she was there drowning under the water. <laughs> 
no burns, praise the Lord. But it was a moment. It was something that there was no time. It was shut up and act. This is Paul's life. He says, one idea shuts me up that I can act. I wonder if you've ever been overwhelmed by an idea like that. And I wonder in myself how much the love of Christ for all men shuts me up so that all I can do is just act. Now, let's stop for a second and reconcile why we are here in church. Many of us come to church, we come here for escape from the world, and that's a good thing. We come here for the fellowship, and that's a good thing. We come here to be encouraged by God's word, and that's a good thing. But why are we here? And I want to suggest, I want to make the suggestion this morning, that if it's not the love of Christ that is causing us to be here, we're missing it. If we're not being shut up by the love of Christ for us and for the world, I think we're missing it. This has been a challenge for me for years, in fact. Is this love of God for people. It keeps me to wonder to the lengths that God went to win me. And the lengths that God would go to win others. That's why I come to church. That's why I wake up at 20 past 5 on a Sunday morning and get a phone call from William and say, you're preaching and don't flip out. (laughs) One thing grips me. Jesus loves the world. I mean, this is what Paul says. Paul says, because we conclude that one died for all. It's Paul's conclusion that Christ's love controls us from what? From the conclusion that Jesus Christ died for everyone. This love gets him going. Now, those of you who are more theologically engaged start thinking, well, is this for the elect? Is it for the unelect? Who is this for? And I love how Paul doesn't even go there. He, he avoids it altogether. In fact, I think he does that for a reason. Because Paul is convinced that because Jesus died, it is now possible, only now possible, for the love of God to be poured out on all men, on all mankind. And you know what's fascinating about that? For the last 2,000 years, the world has witnessed that possibility. I don't know if you've noticed, but the gospel has crept into every nation under the sun. And Jesus' words just ring, and the gates of hell are not prevailing. I don't know if you've noticed this. In fact, I mean, what fascinates me about the country we live in is the gospel came on the back of oppressors and yet found root in the hearts of the people of this nation. Oh, the depths of the wonders of the love of God in Christ Jesus. How it grows and goes. Here we get stuck up with uh, theories of who's in and who's out. Who should we be preaching to and who we should not? I love Spurgeon's response. The story goes that a man came up to Spurgeon after one of his sermons. And he said, uh, basically, you know, this, whoever will come gospel that you preach. If I believed like you did, Spurgeon, about election, I would preach like you do. And Spurgeon's answer, it's so beautiful. He says, if the Lord had put a yellow stripe down the backs of the elect... I'd go up and down the streets, lifting up the skirt tails, finding out who had had this yellow stripe, and then I would give them the gospel. But God did not do that the way. He told me to preach the gospel to every creature, that whoever will may come, Jesus says, and 
Come to me and I will not cast you away. So my friend, you can argue all you like about election. Or you can come. And if you come, even you will not be cast aside. What compels us, church? Spurgeon was compelled by one thing. Not about winning debates. But that Jesus loved the people of London in which he ministered. And he preached to all who would have. He could not shut up about that. In fact, his whole life was stopped. And he could act no other way. Just like Paul. Paul continues in his argument and he says, Therefore all have died. And here comes Paul's motivation for his compulsion. The realization that the love of Christ drove him to the cross to die for all men. And therefore in this one great act of love, Paul including himself in this equation, everyone died with Christ. The beauty is salvation was made possible. Because of what Jesus did. Now I'll look at this nation. I'll look at the country we live in. In fact, I'll look at the world we live in. But let's just keep it local because it's too big to look at the world. It's going to freak us out. We've got problems, right? But where's our hope? Many of us think if we could just get over load shedding, it would be okay. If we could just get rid of the corrupt politicians, it would be okay. If we could just sort out our social problems and our jobs, it would be okay. And I guarantee you it would not. You know what this country needs more than anything else? It needs to come to the realization that Jesus died for them. I want to just get you to think about something here tonight, uh, this morning, church. I'll catch up to myself eventually. Jesus loved South Africa so much that he died for it. Jesus loves the people of South Africa. Jesus loves me. And that is the hope for our nation. That the power of the gospel would go out and change people from the inside that they would change. In fact, this is Paul's Logic. Paul concludes and says, therefore we live for him who died. The logic is this, is when the gospel gets into people's lives, everything changes because they died and now they live a new life. They can act and perform and be different for one reason and one reason alone. What? Because Jesus Christ dies for sinners. It's in light of what Christ has done that we can stop living for ourselves. It's in, Christ, in light of what Christ has done that we can stop obsessing about our little kingdoms and what we need to build. It's when we realize what Christ has done for us, only there will you get rid of the angst and the anxiety and the pain and the problems that you're carrying with you every single week. Now there's a danger in this. As I'm preaching this, this sounds like a whipping. Like a, you're not living this, and I am. Church, I want to, in love, tell you that I'm not. A spiritual mentor of mine. From afar, I've read... Almost every single one of his books and listened to a large majority of his sermons. In fact, it was his ministry that completely changed my life about eight years ago. Uh, Tim Keller passed away on Friday night, late Friday night. It was morning for them. And I remember just weeping about that. Really cut me to the core. But there's something special about that st um, that happened as I was reading through the obituaries that were coming through. One of my professors, my actual systematic professor in Southwestern, uh, in the States, put up an obituary. He said, Tim Keller, rest in peace. 
you preacher of grace. Church, I'm going to have a confession with you this morning. So you know that I forget the gospel of Jesus Christ. Almost weekly, I fall into a trap of convincing myself that it's what I do that matters. It's who I am that matters. Every now and again, it sneaks in that I convince myself that it's me who's the provider of our family. I'm the man of the house, after all, right? And then anxiety destroys me. Every now and again, I get terrified by the thought of being the pastor of this church. Because what will people think of me? How will they hear my sermons? And it terrifies me. And so I'll load up a Tim Keller sermon and preach to my heart again. Because I forget that it's not how good a pastor I am or how good a husband I am or father I am or how well you receive me or like me that makes me who I am. One thing has changed my life. That Jesus thought it fit to die for a sinner like me. And oh man, the ledger of my life is full with reasons for him not to. Just as it is with yours. Yet God, in His great mercy and love, did what? He hung on a cross. And the abandonment that I deserve, because my whole life has been a fist shaken up to heaven, saying, God, leave me alone. Jesus Christ cried on the cross and said, My God, my God, why? Why have you forsaken me? He forsook him because of me. He forsook him because of you. And church, it's that love. It's that love alone that motivates everything I do. You're going to go into your work tomorrow, I guarantee it. <laughs> you're going to wake up tomorrow morning and you're not going to be able to make your cup of coffee because the power's not on unless you're one of those special few who have a backup. And you're going to get stuck in traffic and you're going to sit behind that desk and your boss is going to rile you up the wrong way or he's going to sell you what my boss used to tell me when I worked a little secular job, you are here to make money. That's all you are here for. And a part of my soul died. <laughs> but you're going to be reminded again that you are here to achieve. You are here to prove yourself. You are here to do and be and achieve more. And I, I want to say there's, there's a goodness and there's a badness in that. The goodness is that you are actually designed to achieve, to work. I don't know if you've ever done it. If you've pushed yourself to your limit and you're not crashing, but you're on the edge and you do it and you finish the project, what do you feel like? A million bucks, right? That's your body rewarding you from stressing yourself. Same thing happens if you go for a long run. Those of us mad enough to run, you eventually get something called a runner's high where your body rewards you and says, well done for actually pushing yourself today. But you know what we do? We convince ourselves that's why we are alive. To push ourselves, to make something of ourselves, to prove ourselves to the world, to hustle. And I want to remind you again today, you know why you are here? You know why you were knitted together in the womb of your mother? There's one reason. It's to love God and to receive His love. 
And in fact, so strong is that connection, it's the only one that will last for all eternity. When I got married, uh, the guy who gave us counseling, a guy by the name of Dr. Peter Christofides, some of you might know him, he said his first thing, he sat down, he's like, one of you are going to die. I'm like, nice. He said, so don't live for each other. The only relationship that will last forever is between you and God. Every other relationship will be broken. One will remain. And you know what's beautiful? When Jesus comes again, and you, we receive our resurrected bodies. What does the Bible say? In that day I will be their God and they will be my people and I will dwell in their midst and what? And wipe every tear from their eye. In other words, if you get this right now, you've got an eternity of enjoying this. So let's go back to the start of this question, uh, the start of the sermon. What drives you? What motivates you? What gets you up in the morning? Maybe it needs to be less of what you can do and more a little bit of who you are which is loved by God in Christ Jesus. You can orientate your entire life around that reality. And that will get you up in the morning. What drives you, church? You or Jesus and Him crucified? Let's pray. Jesus, how, how is it even possible to, to communicate that properly? That the holy God of all creation, the God who knows no bounds, who, who has no beginning or end, who has never known sin nor tempted anyone to, should look on a speck of dust like me. And say, you are my child and I love you. Thank you, Jesus, for making that possible. So, Lord, we pray today and confess as a church how deep the Father's love for us. That we are called the children of the Most High. And, Lord, how deep we are. May we now then go in that goodness, Lord, and receive your grace in Jesus' name. Amen.